everyone. Welcome to the Anexapod, the official podcast for Anexnet. This is episode 40, recorded March 11th, 2019. I'm your host, Ned Bellavance, Director of Cloud Solutions here at Anexnet. Here on the Anexapod, we talk technology for the enterprise, covering infrastructure, app dev, analytics, and anything else that is shiny. On this episode, we are going to be talking about data analytics in the cloud with two gentlemen who are no strangers to the analytics game. First up, our own Director of Advanced Analytics, Mr. Brian Atkiss. Welcome to the show, Brian. Thanks, Ned. And joining us from Looker, an Alliance's solutions engineer, Mr. Eric Carr. Welcome to the show, Eric. Thank you, Ned. <laughs> so, uh, Brian, you've been on the show before, but um, Eric, you have not. So why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and how you got into analytics? Um, yeah, I've been working with analytics for quite some time. Started off in the SAP world, okay. mostly doing pipeline ETL work, database administration, data design, data warehousing. And uh, eventually that led me into working with BI and analytics, which mm-hmm. led me into working with Looker as a partner sales engineer. Okay. Sales engineer. I was close. Sales it's engineer. You said SE. Pretty much the same Who thing. Knows? Yeah, yeah. No, <laughs> SE, sales engineer, solutions engineer, they're kind of interchangeable at that point. Gotcha. Uh, it seems to be a path for a lot of uh, database guy, uh, administrators, if they're more interested in, in analytics, to go down that path into the world of BI and data warehousing and data cubes and all that kind of stuff. Is that because that really piqued your interest? More or less. I, I, I've always been fascinated <laughs> by data and how you can structure it in ways that answer questions, right? Really, it's, it's about getting insights from the data. Data all by itself is is not particularly interesting, right? But what we can derive <laughs> from that, the intelligence that we can derive and the decisions that we can make based on that. That's, that's right. fascinating to me. That's awesome. That's awesome. Um, so if I asked you to describe the current landscape of data in most enterprises, I've heard stuff like, data's the new oil. But I've also heard data exhaust, like it's a bad thing almost. That's like two ends of the engine, right? <laughs> um, which of those analogies is appropriate, or are they both? I think it really depends, right? Um <laughs> There's always going to be a curve as people start adopting new technologies and, and start collecting more data. We're, we have more data now than we ever did before, mm-hmm. right? And we have new technologies that let us make sense of that. But at the same time, it's a double-edged sword. We can begin collecting lots and lots of data and not know what to do with it. So, mm-hmm. yes, you have both, you know, the new, the new engine, right, but also that exhaust. I've also heard the terms uh, data lake and data swamp. <laughs> like those. So um, a lot of people, when they're adopting cloud, they decide to go with a data lake strategy. The cloud technologies make it very easy for them to pipe data in from all over the place. Mm-hmm. But then it's very important for them to be able to make sense of it. Otherwise, that data lake just stagnates. No one uses it, and it becomes our quote-unquote data, data swamp. swamp. That's yep. great. Yeah, I'm trying to uh, – in my mind, I'm envisioning – you know, almost a reservoir where you have all these different tributaries of data going into the big reservoir that turns into your big data lake, right? That's that's the idea. But you have to do something useful with that data lake or it becomes the swamp. Yeah. And I, I mean, I definitely agree that it's there's no um, – it's not one or the other necessarily. But I would say new oil is, is probably more appropriate just because you can do a lot with the data. Mm-hmm. Um, and there's, there's definitely a lot more to be discovered. Uh, but – you know, I, I would also say you have to be careful. It's not going to solve every problem. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, it, we're seeing it across many industries and something that, um, you know, has, has been discussed in the sports world. You, you have things like um, Moneyball and baseball or, or everything else where data and analytics are being used to make decisions that um, previously were being made by, you know, a gut feeling by the manager or something right, like that. Right, right. Um, that's changing, right? And so they're using analytics to help them make those decisions. But at the end of the day, there's still a human component to it. So, um, you know, you need to be able to make the right decision sometimes based on data and sometimes based on it, it just seems like the right thing to do. So there's a balance that needs to be to be met. Right. Well, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Um, and Eric, you kind of referenced it briefly, the fact that we're producing more data now than we ever have. Uh, There was some statistic I found that says we've produced more data in the year of 2017 than we had in the previous 5,000 years. So I feel like there's a lot of challenges here. How do you possibly ingest that volume of data into this data lake to begin with? That's a great question, and it's a a difficult question, (laughs) right? Um, I I think 
the first thing that people are doing is is actually adopting kind of that data lake policy to begin with, right? Uh, it used to be that when we would design something for data warehousing or, or for storage or a database, we would design it in a very codified type of way. Uh, you'd break it down, you'd take it to third normal form or voice cloud normal form, or you'd take it and you'd structure a star scheme or something um, for data warehousing that was specifically designed to deal with the fact that databases were really slow, mm -hmm. that you didn't have a lot of space, that right. basically and, and whenever you wanted to store more data, it was going to cost more money. So uh, right. you wanted to reduce the amount of space that you were taking up. And then for asking questions of it, you wanted to restructure all of that because it took a really long time to query and get any information back out of it. So one of the first things I think that, that, that we're doing or trying to do in order to deal with the massive volumes of data now is to really simplify how it's stored. Okay. Um, to reduce the complexity involved in the actual schemas or structures. So technology is helping out with that. Some of the cloud technologies that allow you to do schema on read or columnar databases that really structure data for you in ways that are, are more performant. Mm -hmm. um, so if we looked at it from a traditional standpoint, a, a regular database, you would have all these different tables and they would be related in some way, but it was very rigid. Right, and you, So anything you brought in, you had to do a transformation on that and prepare it to load it into your database, basically, right? Exactly. It, it, it was rigid, like you said. It didn't respond well to changes in the types of data, so it was hard to add new data into it or to change it when your business rules changed or business needs changed. Right, and there was an assumption that there was a certain structure to the data coming in, exactly. as opposed to with the massive volumes of data, they're more unstructured, right? They can be. Or they or can be. They can be a, a mixture of structured and unstructured data as well. Um, and, and really, we do need to provide structure. Data needs structure. It needs semantic meaning. Otherwise, mm -hmm. it's just, again, it's this kind of morass of, <laughs> of non, uh, nonsensical uh, pieces. That, of, that leads us down to the data swamp. It leads us to the data swamp, <laughs> We right? don't want to go to the data swamp. <laughs> <laughs> Stay away from the fetid morass. So that is the data swamp, right? <laughs> okay. um, for sure. Um, but there are a number of ways in which we deal with uh, assigning semantic meaning to things, right? Um, and it doesn't necessarily have to be that rigid database structure. Right. And then from learning databases in, in college, it did feel very rigid and it was hard to get your mind to work that way because our language and the way that we think of things is not typically in the way that a database wants that structured query language, right? For sure. All right. I said something smart. So good. <laughs> <laughs> of course. Um, so, you know, it, data ingestion is a problem, but it also, there's another challenge here. How do you even discover the data that's being produced in the first place? Yeah, I mean, uh, it's, to me, that's a, that is a massive challenge. First of all, there's data, there's internal systems that there's data from, you know, whether that's CRM data, sales data, all, all across the organization, you have different data systems that you need to pull data out of. Mm -hmm. But then outside of that, there's also external data. So there's social media data. Um, you know, you might want to bring in other, you know, weather data or anything like that. You have to, to look at that as well. So in, in reality, you need to figure out what, what are you trying to solve with your data and, and then figure out what, what data is out there, either mm -hmm. internal data that you have that you can bring in to help solve that, that problem or other external data that you can, um, you can acquire from, from another, you right. know, another vendor or, or other means. And for that, those external data sources, does it make more sense to actually pull the data in and store it locally or just refer to it, uh, refer to that external data source when you need it? Right. I mean, that, that's some of the benefits of, of the cloud and being able to pull things in via API or anything like that is you pull when you need it um, and only only as much as you need, right? So right. you don't have to deal with that and the flexibility to, to adapt um, over time is pretty helpful as well. Right. I'm just thinking, like, I don't necessarily need to pull all the weather data from the last 50 years for, you know, Bluebell right. in, <laughs> into my database. Yeah. I could probably get that on demand as needed. Exactly. Right. So... I have found the data. I have ingested the data. Now I need to probably process and prepare it. So how, like, what what would I look for? What would I need to do to start processing, preparing the data for use in analysis? 
great question. <laughs> <laughs> Probably leads to more questions. <laughs> it does. It does. It does. So there, there have been traditional ways of preparing and processing data would have been to let's sit down again, let's create a schema that contains um, the information that we're actually trying to to ask questions of, mm-hmm. and then let's take the information that we have sitting out there and combine it to fit that schema. We do that using ETL, uh, extract, transform, and load. Sure. So we'll take it from the systems, we'll transform it in some way that assigns it into those little rigid pieces, and then we'll load it into our database to ask questions of it. All right? That's the traditional path to get there. Now, we've got so much data at this point, and we've got so many different sources, and they're all structured in so many different ways. That traditional method can be incredibly time-consuming, right? Right, right. So if we, if we look at trying to do this uh, in a traditional way with all of these data sources out there, we are looking at years and years <laughs> to come up with any insights whatsoever. And projects like that, they, they, don't, get, they don't get funded or they lose right. funding after a while because no one's gaining anything from it. Mm-hmm. Um, so what do we do instead? Good question. <laughs> <laughs> I hope you have an answer because I don't. <laughs> there, I do. Uh, um, so once we've connected to the data – or once we've dropped the data into our database, right, and we've created our data lake, we do need some sort of roadmap for, um, for pointing to the pieces of it that we're going to ask queries or ask, ask questions of that we're going to query. Um, so we need a semantic layer, right? We don't necessarily need to put all of that into a rigid pipeline anymore, mm-hmm. but we do need a roadmap so that the end users, our business users, can get in there and ask questions using natural language and, right. and get the information that they want. We don't need them to write SQL, right, or right. structured query language to, to program the database to give them back the information, right? Most of them are not going to have the patience for that as well. Right. Um, so what we want to do is give them a nice semantic layer, some governance. We sit down, we take the business rules, we put that into uh, our governance layer, And then we can present them with a nice curated list of fields that they can put together in whatever way they want and and really ask questions of the data however they like to. I like what you said about the governance layer, and I think we're going to get to that a little bit later. That's good. uh, I'm I'm glad that's already in the thought process, right? Because there are some rules about who can look at what, where, when, and what they can do with that information. Um, But I do want to get into sort of the cloud portion of these things because – while there's a number of technologies that are already out there to help solve these problems, I think one of the most important enabling solutions is the cloud. Would you agree with that? And how has cloud changed the capabilities available to traditional BI and analysis people? So, you know, I think Eric touched on this a little bit, but um, first of all, the ability to scale up to process, you know, the amount of data you need and mm-hmm. then automatically scale down to control your costs. That would be number one, obviously. Right. Uh, but but also just the ability to access data and collaborate from anywhere is, is certainly something that, that is hmm. increasing. Um, and the, the ability to just you know, um, access advanced services for things like predictive analytics, machine learning, um, you know, even, even, you know, in AWS, they have the AWS marketplace where you can connect to other third parties very easily with your data. Sure. Um, and, and even just to test something out, to, to prove it out, see if it works is, is very easy to do. Right. Um, you know, and, and a looker, for example, you have your looker blocks where people can, can pre-configure, um, you know, different things around certain use cases that you can very easily connect to and, and work with that as well. So um, I think just this ability to integrate easily with, with other tools and other systems is, is very, um, is, a, is another added benefit of the cloud. I think that kind of harkens back to what you said earlier about combining data from different sources, like mm-hmm. weather data or historical data about things, without actually having to have that sit physically in a data center somewhere. Right. Right. And I, I think the scalability thing, we could probably expand on that a little bit. <laughs> expand on scalability. That worked out well. Um because, yeah, I mean, when you think about what people have available in their data centers today, they only have a certain amount of capacity, and some of that has to be dedicated to production, obviously. And if you just have this sort of skunk works project that you think might have legs but you haven't gotten the funding for, in a traditional data center, you just don't have the capacity to even try it out. Or if you did, it would take forever to run the queries. I mean, it was just, <laughs> you'd start the query, you'd go to lunch, you'd go to dinner, you'd take a nice nap, <laughs> and then maybe you'd have half of an answer, right? Yeah, sounds like data science. 
Yeah. <laughs> but instead now, uh, you know, you go to AWS or wherever uh, or Google Cloud and and you can spin up a whole bunch of compute capacity, store up a whole bunch of data, have it chunk through it in a very minimal amount of time, and then figure out, is my Skunk Works project actually have legs or does it just stink? Yeah. And it takes away the risk of um, even just evaluating the cloud and using the cloud for analytics to be able to do something very cheaply, very quickly, just like you said. You know, it, it, there's, there's much less risk involved. You can also take that Skunk Works project once you've proven it out, right, and easily productionalize that, right? Mm-hmm. So maybe you're using anonymized data or something in the cloud. When it comes time to run the actual production, you could bring that back in-house where uh, maybe there's data governance rules or something that say the non-anonymized data has to live within the data center or something. It's possible. I'm just throwing it out there. Okay. <laughs> Might have seen that before. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for sure. I've, well, you've seen hybrid cloud situations a lot of times when there are compliance issues, uh, specifically around privacy, personally identifiable information, or things that can't live outside of uh, on-prem security. Right. One of the um, one of the interesting trends that I've seen in the past decade is the influence that consumer tech has had on business. So, if you think about the impact that iPhone had. It reset business users' expectations of what you could do with mobile. I mean, yeah, the BlackBerry was okay. But then when they saw with their personal device all the things that they could now do and then going into their business and getting a BlackBerry and looking and be like, no, this is no good, right? Um, and then, like, Facebook came in and changed how we interact socially. And, again, had, you know, business people are like, well, I want that same experience maybe in, in my day-to-day job world. And then Google made search second nature, so we're very comfortable going and searching for ourselves. So I feel like all of this consumer tech and the way it shifted the way business users behave, and it also changed the demands that they make on analytics and business intelligence. Does that make sense? Does that resonate with you guys? I, I think it does. I mean, at Looker, we talk about uh, there being three distinct phases or waves of BI. So you, mm-hmm. you had the initial first wave, monolithic legacy systems, they were mostly controlled by IT. You really had to have a strong knowledge of how the data was structured and how to write the query language to get anything out of it. So people people would wait um, for their queries, for IT to create their queries. And now the technology has become um, so pervasive that we expect to be able to go to Google to search for things, to do self-service, um, to go on, hop onto Amazon, find whatever it is we need, and have it delivered right. the same day. So people aren't going to wait for that, right? So we have sort of this second wave of BI come along where it's self-service, right? People are asking questions of their own data. They're pulling information from multiple spreadsheets. They're throwing them into a Tableau or a Click, making pretty charts, and they're distributing them. And that's great, too. Right. Who doesn't like a pretty chart? Right? <laughs> I know. They're, they're the best. <laughs> um, but you lose some of the structure, around the data that the first wave had. Uh, right. when, when IT were the experts, they, they could always recommend the best query, right? Mm. So a similar problem you have going out on Amazon, what is the best toothpaste or toothbrush or dog food or cat treat um, that I can possibly purchase, right? I have to figure that out on my own using some sort of metadata or semantic, right, right. semantic information provided by reviews, et cetera. Mm-hmm. Right, so we want to keep that structure. We want to keep the uh, expert recommendation system, uh, but allow for people to also go out and self-service um, okay. in the BI world as well. So that brings us to the third wave of BI, and Looker enables that. Okay. So, uh, did you want? No, I mean, I, I would just say, you know, on, on top of that, I think it's the self-service nature. Obviously, you know, that that's just this whole customer experience focus, um, and customers have just come to assume that that's that's their expectations and that's what they should um, receive but then also just the immediacy of access to everything and the breadth of which you can get access to everything so um you know if it's if it's a google search or or say you want to find a a restaurant um the best restaurant in the town you're visiting Mm -hmm. right so you'll look at reviews you'll figure that out but then also you'll immediately be able to 
get directions to go go drive there or get an Uber to go over there or something like that. Right. So it all happens quickly, and you've you've narrowed down a list of a hundred possible restaurants to one, and you're you're already on your way over there. Right. So it's it's this immediacy and, and breadth of information that consumers expect, and I think business users have those same demands. They want they want their data quickly, they want their reports quickly, and they want them to be robust. And um, I, th- I think the only difference is there's there's a number of different types of users, right? So um, you have data analysts who are going to want flexible dashboards, flexible reporting. They they want that self service. They want to be able to um, to to adjust the data as needed. Mm-hmm. Same thing with data scientists. They but they want access to their raw data. They just want all their data. Right. They want they to get way queries. down in the weeds. Yep. Adjust all the fiddly um, bits. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> but then you also have, you know, executives and directors who just want insights and they, they want their data to tell them what's important. Um, and not only tell them um, what's important or, or what problems exist, but how can we solve those problems? And how can I have a dashboard or report that actually does that? So right. I think one of the challenges is being able to do all three of those uh, at the same time. Because right. <laughs> the, the data set might be the same for all three exactly. of those users, but the way that they want to interact with it is completely different. Yep. I remember uh, it, when I was getting my NBA, one of the things we talked a lot, a lot about was decision support systems. And at the time, the process for putting together a DSS was a long, laborious thing where you had to put together requirements and then design a model and then test the model and then at some point you would eventually deliver it to the executive. But that could be like a six-month process where they said, I want to know this thing. And you'd be like, hey, six months, you'll know. That's not really acceptable anymore. No. Right. So what you're talking about is something that could function as a DSS for that executive but can also function for someone who wants to tick around the data like a data scientist, right? Exactly. Yeah. And that would be the holy grail. Yep, that would be the holy <laughs> grail. <laughs> oh, but you got you have to choose wisely. <laughs> Is that a, uh, it, an Indiana Jones reference? It, it may have been an Indiana Jones I like Jones it. Reference. I like it. <laughs> we, we, don't, we don't want anybody melting or turning into sand. That's, that's no good. <laughs> that's, that's not good data. <laughs> um, I want to switch gears a little bit here and talk about data governance and stewardship because privacy is a growing concern globally. You've got regulations like GDPR that are setting the stage for tighter controls over PII and private data. And I have to imagine that this factors into things like BI and analysis. So what do you think the net impact will be of privacy and security for data? And what are some technical and operational approaches approaches to dealing with those impacts? I can take the first stab at this if you want. Be my guess. <laughs> Go for it. Um, I mean, well, first of all, it's you know GDPR. I think opened the floodgates, uh, but it's not going to be just GDPR. I think Massachusetts just came out with a similar law. Mm-hmm. California is going to be adopting their own, and at this point, no one knows if they're going to be the same or different, or how different they are going to be. And, right. And, um, so you know, there's there's short term impacts and long term impacts. I think short term. IT teams and and just generally everyone's going to be more cautious and um, they need to wait until they figure everything out. Even with GDPR right now, there's no real answer. Like no one knows what it really means to be compliant. You know, you have different different interpretations of the law as as they currently exist. So, um, you know, I think you're going to have certain projects stall or or at least at the very least they'll, they'll take longer or avoid using the data that falls under those regulations in the short term um, until everything shakes out. But in the long term, I think it will. Everyone will figure out what what they can and can't do and how they're going to work with the data. Mm -hmm. Um, But, um, you know, they're just going to have to figure out ways to to be more compliant. And and there certainly are, you know, advantages to that, to using the cloud to help do some of that. And we talked about um, PII redaction um, as well, where – the ability to take a hybrid model where you have data that that currently um, sits on prem that you can run a redaction process to remove any PII data from, mm-hmm. and then move that data to the cloud and use that however you normally you would you're planning to use it. So, um, you know, there's a lot of potential options there, and, and the cloud does provide. Um, it meets most current compliance standards that that companies are looking for, and you know, data encryption exists in transit and at rest, and. Um, you know, there, there's a lot of other things that can be implemented to help, you know, meet those compliance standards. Okay. You want to take a crack at it, Eric? Sure, why not? <laughs> um, so how does it factor into business intelligence and analysis? Well, the first thing you have to consider is that you know, the data that you are accessing, right, 
whatever it may be, needs to be secured in some way. So your database, you mentioned encryption in transit and at rest. Sure. Right? Your database needs to have uh, uh, proper encryption. If you're accessing over an internet connection or a VPN, you need to have that encrypted So while it's in flight as well. But you also need to consider that people who are accessing that data have access to the the correct tuples or, or information itself, right? So um, redacting data is one way to accomplish it, or just filtering out the data that is available for individuals to see. That's an it's an interesting problem because it involves a lot of administration. So you need to make right. sure that the administration of the data available for analysis is is easy and that it's comprehensively designed to support proper hierarchical levels of, of right. so access, right? Having that level of structure is a little bit different than what we were talking about before where things are less structured. Now I do need more of a rigid structure because I need a hierarchy that I can apply sort of role-based access control against. Exactly. And and we also need to consider if we are using a tool that is extracting the data from its original source, Mm -hmm. are we maintaining the security within that tool? If I, for example, access a database, I pull the information into my desktop software, let's say Excel, most popular Mm -hmm. BI tool (laughs) in existence. So I pull it into Excel. Now I've got a whole bunch of data. Maybe maybe I have access to uh, people's addresses or social security information or some other number, Mm -hmm. um, uh, private information that they may not want to get out. But it's now in my Excel spreadsheet. I am now personally responsible for making sure that that's encrypted, that it doesn't leave my computer, um, that the, the information is protected, right? And that's not my job. Right. It really shouldn't be my job, and it can't be my <laughs> job um, it, to to have that data that was protected, that was safe and secured, be extracted. That's problematic. So as much as possible, we need to use the systems that are designed to provide uh, and administrate access as they are without piping data or pulling data into personal machines right. um, or personal anything, anything that, did, that that falls outside of that nice firewall. Right, right. So you set a security boundary. That is your data analytics software, whatever it might be. Um, and yes, technically people can take screenshots or pipe it into an Excel or put it in a CSV, but there needs to be something, whether it's training or actual policies in the software that says, don't do that. <laughs> For sure. And then maybe a second layer of protection, and I've seen this at some organizations we've worked with that have DLP software running on the desktop that's monitoring the files and the content on that desktop. And if they see that you've got uh, an Excel spreadsheet that's full of Social Security numbers, it's going to go, whoa, 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 pump the brakes. What are you doing? I'm going to send a flag up to the security team, and please don't try to email that to anybody right. because I'm going to have to block the email and report you, and you're probably going to get fired. So <laughs> Or save it to a flash drive. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, if you, uh, the, the one client we're working with, you can't, if you put a flash drive in, yeah. it won't even acknowledge that you put a device yeah. in because mm-hmm. they're just dealing with you know that level of sensitive data that they can't let it leak out that way. So, yeah, there's multi-layers of control there. Um, one thing I did want to kind of just come back to because you've mentioned it a few times, Eric, and – and it's, it's a word that you don't hear a lot. So when you're talking about a semantic approach to data analysis, can you sort of break down what you mean by semantics? Uh, it's not a, a necessarily a common word that most people deal with on a regular basis. Yeah, so I would say semantics are basically the, the transformation of data into information. So hmm. we, okay. we provide some sort of context around pieces of data that turns that into actionable content. Um, okay. Does that make sense? It does make Well, it's kind of like if I had a date, but no context for that date, I don't necessarily care about it. But if I have a date and it's today's date and I know it's your birthday, then I should say happy birthday to you. Perfect. But it's not your birthday. It's not. Is it? No. <laughs> oh. Because that would have been amazing. That would have been yeah. amazing. <laughs> <laughs> November. We'll try it again in November. Okay, okay. We'll just, or we again could just November. not release this until November. And say, <laughs> there you yeah, go. I could pretend. Not. I could pretend it's my birthday. <laughs> Happy birthday! Thank you. Oh my God! How'd you know? Uh, just a guess. Well, that's a good thing I had context. <laughs> there you go. 
So that's sort of what you mean when you're talking about the semantic is not just having the raw data, but actually the context surrounding it. Exactly. To, to make it useful to you. And that's how people deal with all kinds of information, whether it's you know letters in a word or a complex concept like math. Yeah, there, there's a really famous um, way of shooting that I think Hitchcock really uh, sort of pushed pushed forward if he didn't invent, where if you show a uh, a woman and then uh, a man looking lasciviously, even though they're not in the same shot, it'll make that person seem lecherous. But if you do the same shot but exchange like a kitten, then it just looks adorable because it changes the context of the two images. Amazing. I yeah. like that. So it, it's something he used a lot in his films. And so it's sort of that same, it's a it's a semantic thing where you're adding context to the information that you've been been provided or you're bringing your own. Yeah, for sure. Ooh, and then we, ooh, we could get into uh, people's own perceptions right. and adding bias to data, but I don't think we have another two hours. <laughs> <laughs> so um, as we're starting to wrap up a little bit, any final thoughts on analytics, the future, the cloud? Where, where should people be looking to, to the future as they, as they go down their analytics ro- roadmap? I mean – like we talked about, it sort of wrapping or going full circle to the beginning. Uh, you know, I, again, I think it is a new oil, although um, maybe maybe we could say it's the new uh, solar or, or whatever you want to talk <laughs> about it. But um, you know, w- there's certainly a ton of opportunity out there and a ton of data to to leverage and, and mm-hmm. to make make sense out of. And I think actually looking at something like machine learning, um, that might be the new oil, right? Where where taking leveraging. Um, automation around all of this right. as well. Actually, I like your solar analogy a lot yeah. better because what we have is we're buried under data in the same way that the sun is shining, but we don't collect all of that energy. Mm-hmm. And actually, the real challenge is converting this massive amount of energy into a usable energy that we can harness for whatever our purposes are. Right. Sort of ML or AI could be the solar panel That's to, the, to yeah. the sun. Yep. Um, and, but we have to make it useful, right? And, right. and make, make sure we actually are doing all that and um, not just putting solar panels anywhere that, that don't actually collect the data. But um, Don't put your solar panels in a cave. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> not very helpful. Right? No. Make sure there's no trees <laughs> over above. Um, yeah. I, and I, I think that that's where, you know, leveraging the cloud to be able to get access to, to the, all this data, be able to process all the data quickly um, for things like machine learning that really can automate this and, and start to generate these, these, those types of insights that we talked about um, that can be not just predictive but also prescriptive. Okay, great. Eric? I, I was going to go in exactly the same direction with yeah. the AI and ML, but I'll take a step back and say if you're just beginning this journey, Right. Mm-hmm. If we're just thinking about doing a migration to the cloud and accessing or harnessing the power of all of this data, let's think about doing it in a way that is repeatable. So mm-hmm. assigning a nice semantic meaning to the actual data we have, giving it to people that are not necessarily uh, programming experts, giving it to business users who really can use it to drive decisions within their organization. and. Then from that point, once we've actually started using the data, once we've actually started to derive insights from it, maybe then feeding it down into that machine learning to do some predictive analysis, and then finally actually prescribing. So moving from predictive into actually prescribing what we're going to do next and, and charting a way forward. Okay. I do think it's important that the humans stay involved. So <laughs> yeah, I, a little I bit. totally agree. You know, you're not going to get those prescriptive analytics, and really not even the predictive analytics without a human telling the machine what to look for. So. Right. Well, and to a certain degree, it's going back to that Amazon ratings things. I can search for what I want, and I can use the expert rating system, but ultimately I'm the person who knows best what I'm actually looking for. And if I read the review and it's something I don't care about, an aspect of the product that, like, oh, I don't care that it came in a slightly different shade of blue than what was on the packaging, that you gave it zero stars, but I think that's fine, then you need that human element to, to, to put – things in context. This is something I always have problems with with Yelp reviews. <laughs> it's like maybe it's just that I don't follow the right people on Yelp, but their rec- restaurant recommendations are always just kind of, I don't get it. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know. Well, maybe we can solve that with uh, AI and ML. <laughs> mm, probably not, though. <laughs> uh, maybe maybe we could. We could, uh, no. No. Um, computers are unlikely to eat. 
uh, in the near future. Mm, though they do make cookbooks. Uh, at least Watson did. Watson did. Yeah. Um, and apparently some of the recipes were good and some of them were just awful. They looked pretty bad to me. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> All right. So if uh, if listeners want to know more about you, Eric, where should they look? Where can they follow you? They can. <laughs> they can contact me on LinkedIn. Um, uh, I'm Eric Carr on LinkedIn. And uh, I'm trying to remember if I have a, a Twitter. I, I don't typically tweet, but if you really, really wanted to tweet at me, <laughs> you could tweet at E R I C C D S, and I'll be happy to respond to any. What about uh, what about Looker? Uh, oh, you got a website? I assume we do. Um, it's Looker dot com. It's easy to remember. Yeah, that's nice to snap that up. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. I don't think anything was called Looker before. It's kind of a tongue in cheek little uh, Santa Cruzy type joke. Okay. Cool. And Brian, where could listeners yeah, find mean, out more about you? Brian Ackes on LinkedIn. Uh, I, I don't have a Twitter, uh, unfortunately. Uh, but, um, yeah, Brian Ackes on LinkedIn or, you know, an exonet, um Dot com is our website. I hope so. That. <laughs> what's, what's your that Instagram? Was de- yeah. That was definitely available. Oh, I don't Instagram. I do Snapchat. Instagram. Snapchat. No, that's uh, the way. I, I, it, sure. What do kids do nowadays, anyway? Uh, I'll let you know when my kids are old enough to have ways. <laughs> there you go. It'll all be different by then. Oh, probably will. <laughs> well, Eric and Brian, thank you so much for appearing on the podcast. It was really good conversation. Thank, thank you, Ned. Ned. It was good to be here. And that was our show with Eric Carr of Looker and Brian Atkiss of Anexnet. Thanks to the marketing team for helping me pull this together. Thanks to Anexnet for helping produce this podcast. If you're looking for a company to help you get the complete digital experience, then I recommend reaching out to Anexnet, see how they can help. If you've enjoyed this episode of Anexapod, why not leave a nice review on iTunes? If you're looking for more content, you can check out our sister podcast, Buffer Overflow. On the show, I am joined weekly by my co-host, Chris Hayner, to discuss what's new and interesting in the IT news sphere. You can find out more about me and what I'm up to on Twitter at Ned1313 or on my website, nedinthecloud.com. Thanks for tuning in, and remember, IT moves pretty fast. If you don't stop to look around once in a while, you could miss it.